Hello and welcome. So this video will be a Just the Facts Ma'am introduction tutorial to getting a high poly mesh that's intended for 3D printing and getting it into Tailspire. So this is great because we now have creature support in Tailspire and we can import our own minis. For this example, I'll be using a mini that I modeled myself. If you are getting your mini from Thingverse or from Printables or some other uh, 3D mesh website, just be sure that you have rights to redistribute the mesh. Make sure that you're giving credit to the model author and linking back to the original model source if you're posting it to the mod.io. Uh, if it's for your personal use, this is less of an issue, but we want to make sure we're respecting the model author's uh, sort of intended use of models and making sure they're aware of how their models are being used. So in this video, I will not be taking time to do explanations. This will be, like I said, a just the facts, ma'am. It'll go in, it'll show you how to do it, and it will not explain why or how or what. So if you need more explanation, go to the longer series. This is meant to be an introduction, especially for someone who wants to see the whole process from soup to nuts. I will have breaks in the video where I do some work off to the side, such as my painting or my scene painting, things like that. So just be aware that you'll see things like that where the video breaks. So without further fanfare, let's begin. All right, so in the Blender workspace, we're going to delete our default cube. This is what appears in most files when you open them. And now we're going to import our STL. So I'm going to import STL. And I'm going to select the model that I downloaded that I had modeled before. It may not appear in the center of your plane. That's normal for 3D models. So we're going to recenter it by going to Object, set origin to center of mass or volume, and then changing the location of the object to be at the 0x and 0y so that it is centered in our Blender workspace. Now, to make sure this is the actual location of the model, we are going to go to Object, Apply, All Transforms. So this will all set down to a basic zero. Next, we want to do basic mesh cleanup. Now, your mesh may not require any cleanup at all, but I'm just going to go through the basic steps that you may need to do. For example, this mesh has a base. We don't want that base, so we're going to remove it. To remove the base, we go into edit mode. In edit mode, we can see this is a very high poly mesh, but what we want to focus on is the base. We can align our workspace to the direct planes by using the widget the little dongle here. Now we're going to go to mesh, bisect, and we're just going to draw a line across our model. We'll make the edits to our bisect in the options for the tool here. I'm familiar with this model, so I know about where I want the cut to be. And the second set of options affects the angle of the cut. Looks good. So I'll accept that. Now we're going to get rid of this ring by selecting part of it, linked, and deleting the faces. We're going to go back into object mode. If your mesh needs cleanup, now is the time to do it. So for me, I'm familiar that this mesh has some oddities in it, including some inverted spaces on the insides and other strange things that will cause some problems when I do my final model. This is not a necessary step, but just be aware that if you have issues later on, it is likely because there's things going on with your model that are acceptable for 3D printing, but cause issues when we create our normal maps and other things that are used when we're creating more of a digital object with different uh, texture layers. So for purposes of this video, I'm going to break away and do a little bit of mesh cleanup. So now that we are reasonably satisfied with our high poly mesh, and it is what we want to use for our model in Tailspire, we can go and prep it just a little bit more for decimation. To do this, I'm going to create a low poly copy of it. And this will be the one I work with going forward. I can hide the high poly mesh. So one thing to keep in mind when we're doing this, details on the surface are not important, such as these sort of rigid details along with these leather straps and these details here. It can be helpful to knock those details down because it helps simplify the overall mesh when we're doing our next stages. So I'm going to do that now. This is done by going into sculpt mode and just taking a smoothing brush and running it over those surfaces. When you're doing this, think about what you're doing as uh, getting rid of details on the surface of the coin. You're not going to be knocking out anything major. You're just knocking out small surface details. 
All right, so with surface details knocked down, once again, that's an optional step, we can take this model and now decimate it. So we'll go back to object mode, and we're going to add a decimate modifier. We'll start with a planar decimate, and we'll knock this up to about 8 degrees for our angle limit. You can go a little bit further, but 8 tends to be a pretty good baseline. And we apply it. Now we can go into a regular collapse decimate, making sure to triangulate our meshes as we go. I prefer to do an iterative decimation, so instead of taking down at a ratio that's very low, I take it down to a 0.5 ratio to reduce my face count by half each time. You'll notice that by triangulating, we didn't do that on the first pass, but that's acceptable. So as I approach my final decimation, one thing I want to pay attention to is my face count. Tailspire will accept models that have up to a 60k face count, but that number is highly unnecessary. Most models that I port in end up hanging around 6k, and that's the average for most of the models in Tailspire. This model right now is sitting at a 12k face count, which is totally acceptable. When deciding what your final face count should be, your goal is to make sure that the low poly mesh is preserving the general shape of your high poly mesh. Another thing I like to consider is whether or not it'll be easy to texture paint and seam paint. So for me, my goals when I'm reducing my mesh is to make sure I'm maintaining the seams so that it'll be easy for me to figure out where I'm painting. And I'm reasonably satisfied that this will end up at around 12K. And I'll make that change and apply it. All right, so now that we're satisfied with our low poly mesh, we want to make our normal map. So to do this, we take our low poly mesh and we make a copy of it. And we're going to call this one our cage. The goal of having the cage is that we have a mesh that completely surrounds our high poly, and this helps dictate how to make our normal. So I'm going to have my high poly mesh revealed and my low poly mesh revealed, and we're going to go into edit mode with the low poly mesh selected, I'm sorry, with our cage selected. With the cage selected, we want to select all the faces by being in face and selecting A, and then we're going to choose to shrink and fatten. With fattening our model, we are going to floof it just slightly so that the low poly mesh so that the low poly cage completely covers our high poly mesh. As we see this did not take very much effort at all. There is tiny little bits poking through and if I notice that I'm going to want to add just a little bit more floof. The goal here is to get the high poly mesh completely surrounded while trying to keep it as close as possible. An alternative to this is if I feel like that's too much floofing and we still have tiny flecks coming through, but only in a few spaces, we can manually move those spaces so that it is covered. So I'm going to do that in this case because it's only a small spot. I'll grab that there and I'm just going to move it just like that. Perfect. And I can go and inspect my model to see if anything is poking through. And we're good. Going back into object mode, I can hide my high poly and my cage and just have my low poly. Now we want to take the low poly and we're going to change the shading on it to shade smooth by right clicking it and going to shade smooth. We can also choose shade auto smooth in Blender, but we may find that this creates uh, some unwanted artifacts depending on our model, Shade Smooth is fine. Now we go into UV editing. So to do the UV unwrap, the basic is to select our whole model and then just go to UV and Smart UV Project. By default, this unwraps based off of Blender's logic, which is decent. If you're using just a direct Smart UV Project, this works well. You'll be able to go in and continue this and do your texture painting and everything just as you normally would and still have a good model. That said, your mileage may vary. Seam painting is very helpful in getting a good UV unwrap that prevents certain artifacts from showing up during texture painting. You can paint around those, but some people find that the prepping your model with seam painting, you're able to do masking and other more advanced techniques that really play out well in the long run. So I'm going to take a moment to do the seam painting on this model and then come back.
Now that I've done seam painting, I can see my seams in bright red when I'm looking at my preview here. And that just lets me know how the divisions are set up. So now if I had done seam painting, instead of doing a smart UV project, I will just do an unwrap. And I can see that all the divisions of the model fall along very logical paths of how I've broken it down. Like I said, that's not necessary. You can rely on the smart UV project, but for my purposes, I decided I wanted to do a seam painting and show you what that would look like when you do the unwrap. So now that that's done, we're ready to go and bake our normals. So to do this, we're going to go into the shading tab and create a new material. Within our material, we're going to add a texture node called an image texture. For this image texture, we're going to set the width and height to 2048, and we're going to call this our normal map. Normal circle. Hit OK. And leave everything here at the defaults. On our side here, we're going to go to our render properties and select our render engine to be Cycles. Cycles is the only render engine we can do baking in. We'll expand our bake options if they're not already expanded, and we'll change our bake type from combined to normal, and we'll check selected to active and check cage. Then we'll select our cage. So to do the bake, we're going to reveal our high poly model and shift click it. This makes it our secondary selection. We could also click the high poly model and then control click the low poly model. Now we're going to bake it. Once your normal map bakes, you'll see it over here as a preview. And this looks like what we would expect. So now we can hide our high poly mesh because we no longer need it. And we're going to make sure we save this normal map. So we're going to go to image and save. With the normal map saved, we can now plug it in to our model for our preview in Blender. This will make texture painting easier. So I'm going to right click and add a normal map node. Connect the color to the color and the normal to the normal. It won't look right initially. We'll need to change the color space here to linear. And now we'll preview correctly. So in our shading view, we can see that our low poly mesh that has only around 11K faces is as detailed as our half million face base model. The next stage we're going to do is texture painting. To set up for texture painting, we're going to go back into our shaders. We're going to add a new image node. Name it our color. I'm going to set the default for this to be transparent on the background. And we'll plug that into our base color. We're also going to do a brief setup so that we can do a fake PBR. So we'll add another image texture. Fake PBRs would require a little bit more. Um, Fake PBRs slash MAORs do require a little bit more explanation as to how they work and why they work, but for now I'm just going to walk you through the steps and just know that they're a little more complicated. I do advise looking at the longer video on them because we are going to be doing a sort of a quick fake on this one. Now to get the fake PBR to connect correctly, we're going to do some tricks. We're going to need a new few. We're going to need a few more nodes. We're going to need an invert node. We are going to need a color ramp node. We are going to need a mix node. And we're going to need a color separate node. Our separate color node. The alpha from our fake PBR will feed into the color of our invert, and this will become our roughness. This is because the alpha of the PBR represents the roughness of the image, and it has to be inverted to display correctly in Blender. The alpha will also become the factor for our color ramp because when we have our channels for AO and metallic, those will be driven by the transparency of our fake PBR. And that gauges the degree at which something would be metallic or have an ambient occlusion applied. The color will go into the color. Red will become the secondary of this mix node, which will stay as a float. The color from the color ramp will be both the factor and our primary.
this result goes into our metallics. We can also use this to preview our ambient occlusion fake, but we're not going to right now. We're just going to keep it in mind while we're working. This is a rather complicated setup in terms of how we're faking the PVR. Just know two things. One, we cannot make mistakes when we're doing this because anything will be imputed onto the image. And two, that it is truly a fake out version of this. There are other ways to do this that I cover when I do an AO video. So just keep that in mind as you're working. That said, it is not necessary. This is probably one of the least necessary parts of what we're doing. I'm including it here in case you have areas of your model that should be bright gloss or bright metallic. Okay, so that is our node set up for texture painting. Let's go to texture paint. When you go to texture paint, you will not see your model initially because you're probably in solids view. Pop over to the shader viewport. Our model looks dark because the base that we have on it is transparent, and that's how it's representing our transparencies. We want to make sure that we're selecting the right image to draw on over here. So for example, when we're doing the base coloring, we'll want to be on the color one. If we're doing our fake PBR, we want to be on the MOAR PBR, and we do not want to draw on our normal map. So as a quick review of what you can use in texture painting, there's a lot of options in Blender. We will do something very simple to start, and then I'll fast forward through my painting. Normally, you can just start with a base paint color and you can do a fill wash, and that gets your entire miniature started. From there, you can use the paintbrush option to paint on uh, different strokes. You can adjust the strength of these, which is critically important when you're working, so you don't make things look too cartoonish, unless that's your goal. And you can also adjust the blend mode. Things like multiply with a dark brush will help add in shadows, especially if you lower the strength tremendously, and can add for some nice subtle effects. You can also do things like color burn and lighten to bring up or down colors. Understanding blend modes is beyond the scope of this video, but just know your options are there, as are other options such as blur and soften and smudge and things like that. When you're painting, you will notice that paint in Blender is projected. So if I'm selecting a color like this and I'm painting on part of my model, you'll notice that it paints beyond the section. It is not just within the sphere of the brush, but it is projected along. This can lead to a lot of overpainting. This is where masking comes in. To mask your model, you'll use this icon here. If your model is white out, then you know that it is masked and you can't paint on that area. This will prevent you from painting in areas you don't want. To unmask an area, you can use any of the selection options, and you can control, click, or shift to select uh, to grab out part of the model that you do want to paint on, and then you can paint just only on that section. So this illustrates one of the benefits of seam painting. If you grab just parts of your model with the control click, and then hit control L, you'll notice that it highlights those entire sections. This is because it's selecting linked with control L and it bases it on where your seams are. This can be helpful when you're isolating parts of your model for painting. Now that we're back, we can see that I've done just a basic paint. Now, what I want to talk before I go in further is I want to talk about that fake PBR. So the fake PBR is basically our way of saying, okay, we're going to want areas that are metal. So in this case, I've this guy probably wouldn't actually have any metal, but we're going to pretend for a bit and give him some sort of brass stuff. Um, and anything that would be glossy, maybe like eyes or maybe the leather, a bit of gloss. So what I want to do is set up a very basic PBR. Now, remember when I said that you have to do this without making any mistakes as you go, and you have to only use two colors. So we're going to set up our color palette with two of those colors. And the first of those colors is going to be an RGB channel that is full green and nothing else. I'm adding that to my palette. The second one is going to be a full yellow, so full red and full green and nothing else. Even though metallic is done by red, if you go full red channel, it'll be red without any ambient occlusion on it, which will mean it will just come out dark and black. It won't be what you're looking for. So when you want red, you really want yellow. So, so when we want metallics, we want yellows. So think metal gold, green gloss. So we're going to start 
And what I've learned is that sometimes it's helpful just to have a very basic fill over the entire model of green that's fairly low. In this case, I'm going to do it like a quarter um, ratio. This is because we'd at least have some roughness and some AO on the model. So I'm going to go ahead and fill that, make sure I've got my effect alpha. And we can see suddenly how that has affected the model and given it a little bit of sheen. I'm not going to worry about leveling up slowly with these. I'm just going to go straight in on the rest. So things to keep in mind, if I want gloss, I really don't want to push this above uh, the strength of 0.8, like 80%, 70%. Same thing for my metallics. If you go too far, it just doesn't look right. So I'm just going to do this as an example. And I'm going to make sure I've got this on mix. I have my color and my strength is, I'm just going to push that to like a 70 for now. All right, so I'm going to paint the eyes to be full gloss. They catch the light. So then I'm going to take the metal areas and I'm going to paint them yellow. Now, I want to make sure I'm knocking this down so it's not up too far. And I'm just going to paint right over these areas and we can see in our life preview they do show up metal. Now if you make any mistakes you have to be sure to undo them with control Z. There is a method by which you can do a true undo but we're not going to go into it too much. Um, we're just going to show you the, um, the quick version. So I'm even getting a little too strong there but that'll do. slightly metal, but again, for our purposes, I'll make it pretty shiny. So that may be all that you do with your fake PBR. If you want to get a true PBR out of Blender, it's relatively complex. I'm going to be doing a separate video on that because I know people will be interested in getting it, especially for certain models. Otherwise, just build your shadowing into your model when you're doing your painting and go from there. So now that we have our image texture, our normal map, our model, and our fake PBR, we can export all of these for Tailweaver. So to do that, we just take each of our images and save them. And then we take our model itself and we export it as a wavefront object. The default settings set up by Blender are fine for this. Make sure you have your limits to selected only though, if you have multiple models in your scene. So now we have our model exported, our PBR exported, our colors exported, and we previously exported our normals. So we can go and see what these look like in Tailweaver. So Tailweaver Lite is a Unity package that allows us to take all of our Blender assets and convert them in to a Tailspire ready asset. So one that can be used to mod your game. I won't go into all the details of how to use Tailweaver Lite that is well covered in other guides and they may change as things develop. I'm going to mainly talk about how to see your object that you exported and make it work all together. So what we want to do is first import our assets, which I've already done, but you'd go under import new asset to do this. Then we'll select our assets. So in this case, I'll select my mole model. By default, he was actually turned around a little bit, which can happen. So you can just adjust the rotation if you need to. Now I've got him looking forward. Now I want to look at my normal map first. So I'll select my normal map. By default, it may not look correct. You may have a button at the bottom that says uh, adjust import settings. When you do that, it'll pop up and look right. Now let's look at our color texture. And there's our color texture looking as we would expect. Then we can add our MAOR or our PBR texture. So I'll grab that. And as we see, this lightens him up a little bit because of the ambient inclusion sort of aspect of it. We also now see that our metals are metal and that our eyes do have the gloss that I added to them. 
So that is showing us that we are really ready to go. And he looks decently good. The other thing here I want to talk about is the paint wash. Paint wash is an element in Tailweaver Light that adds a coating to the miniature to make them match the aesthetic of the rest of Tailspire. So this is where it looks more hand painted and you'll see these sort of details. So if you take it off, you'll see a little bit more of that sheen where adding it gives it a little bit more of that look that makes it fit in with the rest of Tailspire. This is basically everything you need to know to get your miniature ready. Now I might go back and fuss with this and get the texture paint how I want it a little bit better, but this is a good start. All right, and that's all I have. So this video, we've covered the very basics at a very high touch of the quick, fast and loose method of taking a high poly mesh that's intended for 3D printing and breaking it down through Blender into some objects that can be imported into Tailweaver and then used in Tailspire. I hope this has been helpful. This is a very, very quick overview. So I do recommend that if you have other questions, you can feel free to ask me, but also check out the other videos and just sort of see what you can glean from those that fills in the gaps. And so that's all I've got. Have fun and take care. Mm -hmm.